Hello. Today, let's talk about God's new springtime. The text before us is Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. This is the return of Jesus Christ. Introduction. There are places on this earth that are extremely cold. Some of them are cities right here in the United States. For example, Fairbanks, Alaska has a winter that begins in October and continues through March, six months, over 180 days of relentless, freezing, bone-chilling winter. The minimum average temperature is negative 17, and the low temperature is 66 degrees below zero. North Dakota and Minnesota experience cold that is almost as severe. Grand Forks, North Dakota, has no mountain range to break the wind and no body of water to bring in the warmth. So expect winters with lows of negative 43 and January temperatures that rarely rise above zero degrees. Duluth, Minnesota is situated right next to Lake Superior. The lake effect snow makes it one of the snowiest cities in the country with an annual accumulation of 86 inches of snow and 106 days of the year below freezing. In these places, prolonged winters with ripping winds, mountains of snow and treacherous ice make the coming of springtime a source of absolute joy. Even the ardent winter lover sees spring bringing a song to the heart and warmth to the soul. The birds sing, the plants bud and blossom, and sunny skies mean that bunnies hop and children dance. Spring is a warm and wonderful new beginning. Now, that is exactly what our Lord Jesus is talking about in this gospel from Mark 13. It is the return of Jesus the long-awaited second coming of the Son of God, and this time He will come not in humiliation, but in exaltation, and He will bring a heavenly springtime after centuries of bleak winter and the freezing cold of darkness and death. Of course, Jesus is not speaking in terms of earthly weather, but of spiritual spring. The second coming of Jesus will be a wonderful and eternal season of warmth and joy for all who believe. Jesus himself will be our sunrise and his glory will shine upon all who believe. Point one, the signs of spring. There will be some pretty significant signs for the second coming of the Lord. Jesus explains that the stars will be falling from heaven. The physical universe will be disjointed. The sun and moon will move out of orbit and there will be darkness everywhere. Then suddenly and wonderfully, Jesus will be seen riding his sky chariots, the clouds of heaven. Earth and heaven will be passing away. The disorientation of this out of joint world will enable every eye everywhere to see Jesus when he appears in his heavenly power. In the midst of cosmic darkness, a glowing and glorious Jesus will come. At this point, Jesus uses the spring imagery of a fig tree. When the branch of the fig becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, summer is near. In spiritual terms, this sign means that a new heavenly age is about to dawn. What a joy, and what excitement will fill our hearts. It will be better than sunshine in Alaska when you see these things happening. Rejoice for God's heavenly springtime is about to arrive. Jesus is near. When will this happen? Our Lord gives no specific date, but Jesus does declare in Mark 13, verse 30. 
Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. That does not mean that his coming will occur within a generation, that is, within 30 years of his crucifixion and resurrection. Obviously not. This is a figure of speech. We've heard it before in the Old Testament. This generation, it refers to a stiff-necked and sinful generation of humanity. They see the work of God and they call it evil. They see the work of Jesus and they call it foolish. Obviously, this generation of humanity is still with us. But for those of us who believe, the appearance of these signs will have a very positive effect. God's eternal springtime is upon us. Point two, be on the alert. Did you notice that three times in the final five verses of this gospel reading, Jesus exhorts us to be ready. Be on the alert, says the Lord. But what does that mean exactly? What are you supposed to do in order to prepare for the second coming of Jesus? Well, I suggest at least three things. First, clean up your house. When friends are coming to visit, you want to make things ready for them, so you clean up your house. You wash the sheets and blankets for their bedroom. You vacuum the floor and you dust the shelves for them. Why? Because you want to show them that they are important to you. Their relationship is precious. They are precious. So you want everything to be just right and ready for them to arrive. And you want them to be honored. But what if they're coming from a long distance and suppose you're just not sure when they're going to get there? They may come in the morning or they may take all the way until the afternoon or perhaps they may arrive late into the night. What then? Well, you have prepared for that too. You have cleaned the house in the morning, but you don't let it get all messy in the afternoon or in the evening. You keep it clean and ready for their arrival, no matter when they arrive. Now, you and I do not know the hour of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we must clean our spiritual house, and we must keep it clean. We want to do this in order to be ready to receive him and welcome him, because he's precious to us, and because we want to honor him and also because he is the Lord of glory, the Holy One of heaven. And we do not want our spiritual house to be filled with sin and evil when Jesus comes. We know that if Jesus were coming this afternoon, we would clean our filthy thoughts and our nasty words and our sinful deeds. Oh yes, we would get as clean as possible, surely. We would repent right away and be as clean as we could be if Jesus were on the way today. But of course, Jesus is on the way today. That's the whole point of this teaching that our Lord has given to us in Mark 13. So, what shall we do to get ready for his coming? First, clean up your house. Second, I suggest that you prepare a gift. Now, from the outset, I want to clarify that Jesus needs no gift, and it is he who is the gift giver. Yes, Jesus himself is the most precious gift of all. There is nothing that we can or should do in order to get the kingdom, or to buy salvation, or to merit it with our good works. The kingdom of God and salvation are gifts given to us by Jesus. He has done all the work. He alone has given these gifts. We are purely passive recipients. We receive his gifts of forgiveness and salvation by grace through faith and not through any works of our own. However, having said that, when someone we love is coming to visit, it's natural to want to give them a gift. Think about, think about Christmas for a moment. It's an exciting time, friends and family 
get together, and we want to give gifts to those we love. Of course we do. The presents are exciting, especially for the children. So imagine a naughty child. She or he may want to investigate those presents under the tree. She or he may want to wait until no one is looking and carefully peel back the scotch tape and look inside to see what present awaits him or her. What stops that curious child? Probably it is the thought that mom may come down the stairs at any moment, or that dad may catch them in the act. So, they stop themselves. They know that they should not steal a peek. For love of parents and for fear of punishment, they do not. But is that what Christmas is all about? No. It's not about stopping oneself from stealing a peek. No. It's about giving and receiving heartfelt gifts. That is to say, it's not enough not to do the evil because Jesus is coming. It's also right to do the good. So for the Christian waiting for the second Christmas, the second coming of Jesus, it is not enough to stop doing what's bad. We must also try to delight our Lord by doing what is good. So, we want to offer him gifts that would make his heart glad, not to get into heaven, but because Jesus has already given heaven to us by grace through faith. So, what gifts can you offer Jesus when he comes? Well, you could love others and care for others for a start. That would delight his heart. And you could care for the sick and the needy. You could serve the poor and the hungry. You could truly forgive and be reconciled with those who have wronged you. Yes, these things would delight the heart of Jesus. You could share the gospel of his life-giving cross with those who do not know him. That would truly delight the heart of Jesus very much. These are the gifts that you could give to Jesus, and in doing so, you would be on the alert, you would be getting ready for the second coming of Jesus. And third, I suggest that you simply enjoy what you already have. The second coming of Jesus Christ is the beginning of the eternal springtime. His arrival will alter heaven and earth. It will put to right all sorrow, suffering, and sadness. It will turn our sin-sick, freezing winter world into a warm and wonderful spiritual spring. But you already have received a foretaste of this eternal feast. You already have been born again in Christ Jesus, and you already have him alive and living in your own heart. You are a temple of God, and the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Jesus lives within you right here and right now. You remember when Martin Luther was asked what he would do today if Jesus were returning tomorrow. So the story goes, Luther responded that today he would work in his garden or he would plant a tree. What is the point? It is that Luther was already ready to meet the Lord. He was already on the alert. His spiritual house was swept and clean as much as is humanly possible. He had offered his gifts of loving others, serving the church, and sharing Christ. So what was left? He would continue doing what he had been doing. And if Jesus came today or tomorrow, Luther would enjoy the gifts that Christ had already given to him right now and every day. Everything needful for you to be ready, everything needful for you to be ready for Jesus has already been done for you by Christ. You can clean your spiritual house, yes. You can do that which delights Christ's heart, yes. But remember, the real work of preparing for the second coming of Christ, Jesus already has done it for you. When he forgave you all of your sins, and we, when he made you his own holy and heavenly child, by grace through faith, he made you ready for his second coming. Conclusion. 
There are some places in this country that are extremely cold. But the truth is that every place on earth and every person living on it has been bitten by the freezing cold and darkened death of spiritual winter. Jesus, the sunshine of our hearts, has already come once. He came in humiliation and meekness. He came as a servant and as a savior. His second coming will be when we do not expect it. But you do not need to be afraid. It will be like the breaking of sunrise on a spring morning. His glory will fill the sky. His warmth will fill the heart of every believer. To tell you to be on the alert really is an understatement. Get ready to receive the best Christmas present that ever is given. Be on the alert for the most wonderful and marvelous spring day that will never end. Beloved, Jesus is coming again. Can't wait. Amen.